Hey friends, thanks for joining me, Jim Baroud, to hear a few insights from leaders who represent our innovation ecosystem. Today's chat is with Richie Twaru, co-founder of Mobius and the pioneer of immersive artificial intelligence. I'm co-founder and chief creative officer of a company called Mobius. We've been around for about three years. We were in stealth for about two and a half of those. We just started to engage with the market and we've been working on something called immersive AI. This is a combination of machine learning, computer vision, and principles of the natural user interface. Think about it as Minority Report meets the metaverse without the need for a headset. That's the big part of it. Having a lot of fun. I'm in the tech and invention part of it. And I've got a really, really awesome co-founder named Mike Sutcliffe, who's doing all the commercialization and the strategic partnerships. Fantastic. Um, I can't wait to see the demo that you're working on, but but I really want to hear your story because I think you have a, a really fascinating and very unique background. So tell us about your journey in technology and into innovation and entrepreneurship. My story is of the archetype of an entrepreneur's journey. Um, I was born in South America, in Guyana, which is a British colony, and I migrated to the U.S. Um, and did uh, undergrad and the rest of my education in the U.S. So um, computer science major, um, hacker-ish by definition, I suppose, um, you know, grew up during the AOL chat room time and the internet. And then my career is broken up into three parts. Um, I was on the buy side of technology in the financial services industry. I spent some time at Prudential Securities, which is now Wells Fargo, Lehman, which is now Barclays, and then UBS. And then on the sell side of healthcare, and then in entrepreneurship, those three uh, um, sort of parts of my career have a single thread about them. I always seem to find jobs that uh, that are at the pioneering front of the trend at the time or the trend to come, or um, the jobs seem to find me. At, at Prudential Securities, uh, it was desktop computing, um, and at you know I was involved in building the first interface between the IBM CICS mainframe and desktop computers. So that so that financial service executives can kind of use you know a desktop app um, at Lehman Brothers. It was a lot of the the mobile banking and internet banking at UBS. It was a lot of enterprise social mobile banking and cloud computing, and that was my buy side experience. Then I went to the sell side in healthcare, which is really different. You have a really good appreciation for technology salespeople at that point and solution providers. That was a little bit of a wider bird. So that was an industry view, not, not like when I was in financial services in one organization. And there was a lot of cloud computing and some of the decentralized stuff, the blockchain. And then in entrepreneurship, the last five years, my first startup was in privacy and the 31st human right. We can talk a little bit about that if you want. And then most recently here in Mobius. So it's it's always at the at the front of of either the curve that's happening or the curve to come and new markets. That's that's really interesting. Let me just dive into that a little bit. When you say the buy side and the sell side, for people who aren't familiar with that terminology, what does that mean? Well, there are there are companies that build technology and sell them. You know, like Microsoft or like Oracle or like Salesforce. And then there are the companies that buy that technology. And it's a, it's a big differentiation. If you're CTO of UBS, you're buying technology, right? But if you're SVP of the financial services industry in Salesforce, you're selling technology. And while those two things, uh, those people work a lot together, the experience of being in the seats are fundamentally different. Got it. Okay, that's that's helpful. Now, Let's talk about the um, the last startup that you mentioned, the digital rights, uh, human rights. Uh, I rem I met you during that venture. So tell us a bit about that and, and what you learned from it. Well, the, the thesis was really, really simple. The thesis was that just like we can get primary income from our labor because there are labor laws and we can get primary income from our intellectual property, our thoughts, because there are IP laws, the thesis was that we should get primary income from our data as well, because just like our ideas come from us and our labor come from us, our data comes from us. And so the whole idea was that there ought to be a new relationship between consumers and corporations about this exchange of data that starts with the I accept button that you click on. Um, the go to market was around a, a, a new human right. As everyone knows, we have or if you don't know, we have 30 human rights. 
So at the time we had defined boldly a 31st human right that would classify human data as human property. And the, the entire thesis was that property law was perfect to now build those relationships between consumers and corporations. We got all the way to a term sheet on a series A and uh, three days before we were supposed to close, we had the COVID lockdown and, uh, and that uh, entire entrepreneurial journey uh, uh, went up in flames. Wow, what, what a story. Um, and then so what happened then? I'm sure that was devastating. <laughs> well, what was your next move besides so well, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, you know, well, so so there are two ways that a company can end, right? Uh, a startup company can end because it had to end, right? So internal things are sort of, you know, things that are within your control and then things that are completely outside of your control. With humanity.co, the COVID lockdown was completely outside of our control. So the first thing I did was I went to my wife and I said, "Hey, you know, that plan that we had, um, you know, the stock market is dropping. We don't have enough years left anymore. And by the way, there's no company anymore. And I was looking for some some spousal comfort, I guess. And, I, you know, we had young kids. We had a six month old and she was burping a baby. And she looks at me and she said, well, I didn't marry a guy with one idea. And, and, and that, that was essentially the transition from, oh, my God, this idea is not going to work. I have to think about what is the future now in the context of COVID and what do we think is actually going to happen next? And that's where Mobius was born. Okay. So take us through that sort of process and that timeline, right? We're in COVID. You have this really neat idea. Everyone has neat ideas, right? <laughs> Taking it from someplace where it's an idea in your head to where it is, for example, where Mobius is now is extraordinary. So talk to us about that sort of timeline and journey. Well, the idea started full crazy. Today, it's kind of half crazy, quarter crazy, but the idea was full crazy. When I looked at COVID a couple of weeks in, the thing that jumped out at me was that we're going to be remote more. And that if this thing lasted more than about a year, the entire world's perception on remote is going to change. Because we had already started seeing remote weddings, remote funerals, uh, remote work, you know, um, remote telehealth, um, remote happy hours. In the first couple of weeks, all of that was normalized. So the thesis was that if we're going to be remote, how are we going to actually extract more from this experience? How are we going to feel more? How are we going to exchange more? How are we going to go past these kind of square boxes that we're looking at here in front of us? And how are we going to transfer more to each other? That was the that was the big thesis. And at the time. You know, uh, the VR AR market wasn't really a thing. It took a, it was about a year after that that Zuckerberg renamed Facebook to Meta and really made the metaverse a thing. And I looked at the headsets that were in market, and I looked at the Oculus. Everyone's got one in their basement, right? And I looked at it, and I just didn't feel that where humans were going to go is that we're going to stick headsets on our heads forever. I just didn't think that that was going to be the future. And more importantly, I'd just become a dad. And I looked at that and I said, the last thing I want for my kids is for headsets to be on them eight hours a day to consume all the experiences that were out there. So the big idea was, could we get more transferred on the screens that we had? We see it in the movies all the time, right? Tom Cruise, Minority Report, right? Um, you know, Iron Man, you know, all this type of stuff, but it's just movies. And uh, I had a crazy idea that these screens that we have right now could actually transfer more than what we're able to transfer through them. Full crazy, no idea where to start and how to start. Um, you know, seed funded it myself to find the first developers to try a couple of things. Um, we got a breakthrough at about $100,000 of engineering. We got the first breakthrough that says, huh, these screens can do a lot more than we've been doing with them. We looked at the academic literature, there was nothing there. We looked in the patent world, there was nothing there. And that led to capital uh, raising and building of a team. And today, we, you know, we're not full crazy anymore. What I'll show you a little bit later on is that we can transfer a lot more through these screens and it won't require a headset. Got it. Okay. That's very helpful and very exciting uh, and really extraordinary. So let's, let's get into the demo then, and then we could talk about industry and things like that afterwards. How's that sound? So let me share my screen. 
Um, just for a little bit of housekeeping, um, there is no new hardware on my machine. This is a Mac. This is commodity hardware that's here. And I don't have any devices on me. So I, you know, I don't have any hardware on my hands or on my head or anything like that. What you're looking at is what we call Airglass 2. And this is an immersive and interactive experience that is on the screens that we have already. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to log into an experience here. Here I am in what we call the Mobius lobby. You'll notice that I'm in what looks like a virtual world, okay? And if I move my head to the left or to the right, you're seeing a reflection of my perception. But as this screen reacts to my head, what I am getting is a perception of depth. If I lean forward, the screen leans in towards me. If I lean back, the screen leans away. And this experience feels completely different from the experiences that we have with the flat 2D experiences that we have on the screens today, right? So if I move around, what I'm feeling is I'm feeling this perception of depth where it feels like I'm in a much more intimate relationship with the content that's displayed on the screen. Now, a, a lot of us have seen these before. You've seen it in AR and VR headsets. This is without a headset. My hands are also active. So if I pop my hands up in the air here, as you can imagine, I can start to do things with them. I'm just gonna take my hands and rub it on the sides of the room. This is just playing a random uh, set of guitar notes over here. So in this virtual world that I'm in, my hands can start to activate with the virtual world or with digital twins that are inside of here. Um, this is computer vision. This is machine learning, and this is aspects of what is called NUI, the natural user interface. For those of you who are old school, you remember the command line user interface went to GUI, and then GUI was supposed to go to NUI. Well, here's NUI. We got pretty good precision on this. Um, again, commodity hardware, I'm just gonna make a gesture here and I'll start to draw into the air. You'll notice that as my hand moves, we're able to draw ink pretty precisely in the air. If I lean forward, that zooms in. Um, we can really activate the depth with this. If I lean to the side, you'll see that I actually drew the ink into the air. I can throw a gesture up and kind of erase the ink as I need. So as promised, on the screens that we have today, the ability to transfer more than just a screen share of a PowerPoint slide or a screen share of an Excel file here, you know, as we move from a world where we were only sharing information, here you can start to share ideas. You might even share your imagination. Let me show you a couple of showcases that we built with these. So I'm just gonna instruct to pull up a couple of showcases here. Here's a collaboration showcase. You notice as I move my hands around, I get the equivalent of the hover of a mouse. There's a little yellow bar around the one that I want. Let's say I wanted to show the collaboration showcase. Here I'm in a completely different virtual environment that I can look around. I'll raise my hands up to pull up my slides. For example, if I had my slides that I wanted to present, right? You know, move my hands around. These are the slides that I've loaded up. This is just PowerPoint. I can grab a slide and just pull it forward with my hands, right? Right there in the air. What this slide is saying is that we can show people, places, and things to any consumer that has a device that's connected to the internet. So we massively expand the distribution of immersive and interactive content. You know, there's 50 million headsets in the world. That's one distribution channel. There's 4 billion people that have devices that are connected to the internet. That's an ADX expansion of the distribution channel. So I'm just gonna put my hands up, highlight this slide, grab it, just push it forward and close out what we call a carousel, right? That's the type of stuff that we can do in here. I'm gonna show you just two more things really quickly. I'm gonna go back out to that lobby. This is one that we're working with a, with a pharmaceutical company on. Now I'm the only one here in the air glass. Obviously other people can be in here with me, right? Um, this is a nice, uh, you know, kind of like a futuristic lab, I suppose that we mocked up here with a pharma customer. You know, this is a live Salesforce record. I'm gonna just grab that record with my hands and pull it forward. Now you can have the conversation with the rep and the doctor at the same time put my hands over to the side and just swipe it. This is a beating heart. So this is a 3D model of a beating heart that's running off of simulated data. I'm just gonna grab it with my hands and start to turn it around and move it around like that. So my hands are engaging with the digital twins that are loaded into the virtual world at the same time. The one that I like to show that I think is, is pretty good, um, this actually works for movies as well. So this is a scene from Finding Nemo. Okay, and if I lean forward, you can see that I can, I'm can. i leaning into the ocean. And if I lean back, I'm leaning away from the ocean. I'm gonna put my hands up 
And just imagine like a, like a car steering wheel and make a fist and just turn this around and just make a fist and turn this around. So you'll see what I'm doing here. I'm spinning this movie while it's playing and I'm leaning in and leaning out and looking at the movie. There's Nemo right there. I could find him with my head, almost like a soccer ball, right? So this is the power of the technology that we've engineered. It's computer vision, machine learning, aspects of the natural user interface. I'll show you one cool thing here for a second. If I lean to the side, and just lean my head in, it puts me on a flight path. And we have different flight paths we can build. This is a circular flight path. I'm just gonna put my hands up and start drawing with that same ink. What you'll notice is that I'm watching a movie, I'm spinning my perspective in, in real time, and I'm drawing in 3D in that movie. So any Pixar movie, you know, any Disney movie, kids can now interact with the objects in there while they're watching the movie from different perspectives. Of course, this is not gonna sell more goldfishes or Nemo's, but I wanted to just give you a point of view around how this immersive AI behaves on the devices that we have today, on the media that we already use. I'm gonna use my hands to spin it around now. I'm spinning around the drawing, I'm gonna zoom out so you can see that, that I did in an ocean while finding Nemo is playing to random data. So that's a little bit of what we are working on here at Mobius and, and that's why, but when I said we were full crazy to start, we were full crazy to start this. And I, I think we're, we're a little bit below half crazy now because we have these showcases that we're starting to work with really pioneering customers with. That is fantastic, Richie. I mean, it is so extraordinary. Um, the possibilities are sort of endless, right? I mean, ha you showed entertainment, you showed business, you showed health, right? And there's obviously learning. What are, what do you see as sort of uh, the most sort of opportune sectors, uh, you know, for uh, this technology? So there's three that we're seeing the most interest in. Number one is CPG. So this works on the web. You can turn an entire website immersive and interactive. So think about your go to estelauder.com and now you could just swipe through the different products that they have, grab the one that you like, spin it, open it, take a look at it, zoom in, look around and get a feel for what that looks like. Um, a lot of the early work that we're doing, the fact that you can have this deeper relationship with the screen now where you can transfer more information with each other, people are looking for a collaborative experience. So we're building presence into the experience on the web. So you go to a flat website, you see a product, you like it. But if you wanted to go into the showroom with someone from that organization, now we put you into that showroom, we load the product up into the middle and you're having a video call in a virtual world with the digital twin of the product at the same time. So that's category one of the experiences that we're seeing. Category two, you hit on right away, training, upskilling, right? A lot of what's going on right now is fear around the commoditization of knowledge work. And so we're seeing a lot of opportunities where people want to train people in AI, train people in different uh, in different skill sets. You know, in, in the Middle East, if you think about the Vision 2030 work that's going on there, there's a massive need to upscale the population of some of the countries in the Middle East. So we're seeing a lot of a lot of excitement around training, upskilling, any type of education type type experience. And that's because education is really hard. Like Zoom and Teams were meant for, you know. I couldn't make it to a meeting, so I'll show up in a rectangle, but it wasn't made to engage students in that parent-teacher relationship. So we're seeing a lot of that. We're experimenting with some universities in the US as well. And then third is around the, the real representation of data. You know, there's a lot of flat data in the world that you can look at that's a chart or a supply chain of, of an oil company, right? But you look at it as a table or as a chart. We're seeing a lot of interest in visualizing that data in 3D so that you can start to see that data from different perspectives and tap on a specific area and expand the node and see what it looks like. Um, I, think, I think these are probably still the geeky use cases. Um, to me, the things that are really obvious is like I look at my television and just swipe it to change the channel. Like that, <laughs> that is probably the most obvious use case to me, right? Um, because it works with the screen and the camera, you don't need a keyboard and a mouse. And so if you think about those TVs that you see for advertising at an airport, for example, now when you stand up in front of that television, if you add a camera to it, 
you can engage with that content without the need for a keyboard and a mouse. The real invention here is a photonic peripheral, right? So we've had electronic peripherals, which are electricity-based, the keyboard and the mouse. This is light-based, so we call it a photonic peripheral. The human body is the controller. So I think, I think this is going to evolve. Um, there's no question in my mind that every screen will be immersive and every volumetric unit of air in front of that screen is going to be interactive. What's going to be the killer use cases? I mean, man, that's like that's like seeing Amazon when AOL chat came out. It's really hard to tell. Right. And so we're now in this age of generative AI. And obviously, you guys are using AI, have been using AI. And so is there a marriage between the two? Is there something that you're seeing that you didn't see six months ago that is really getting, getting you even more excited about the possibilities? Absolutely. Absolutely. Generative is massive, right? I mean, it's it's just probably one of the biggest things I've seen in my lifetime. And even as a, as a pioneer in the space of AI, as a subset of AI, it is so big that you have to respect it and give it its credence. Um, from an AI perspective, broadly, at first I'll say AI has been around for a long time. More than 4 billion people in the world use AI, I would estimate, more than 10 times a day. Right. Every time your car corrects you when you're going too close to the lane, that's a form of AI. Right. Machine learning was taught to look at the lane using computer vision in real time. Right. Every time Siri tries to talk to you when you're not actually talking to her, that is a form of AI as well. Right. Every time Netflix suggests a new movie to you based on your your um, you know, your your watching preferences, that's a form of AI. What's unique about generative is the fact that not only can you actually massage information now, you can get inspiration from it, right? And that inspiration is very, very exciting to me. If you think about marrying generative with some of the Nerf-like technology that's out there that can turn 2D images into 3D environments and some of the generative 3D things that are coming up, I think that when gener generative starts to generate 3D experiences at consumer scale, the amount of 3D content that will be created is going to cr create a vacuum for our viewing mechanism, right? Because there's everything is going to be 3D and you're not going to put on a headset or a smart glass eight hours a day to just consume it. So I actually see generative, not the text version of it with, with chat GPT specifically, but the 3D artistic creative version of it, creating an avalanche of 3D content that's going to have to be distributed. And we think we're positioned opportunistically to deliver that with software as opposed to deliver it with hardware. The software distribution channel is ADX broader than, than the hardware distribution channel right now. Right. And let's go back to uh, even Zoom meetings, right? Or even just you know collaboration. This could enhance that and make it so much more rich, right? Yeah. So we put out we put out Airglass in the market. Airglass is in 2D. And Airglass is, competes with Zoom and Teams. We have pilots that are going on with enterprises. We're getting a lot of feedback. The, the secret inside is that that Airglass is going from 2D to 3D. And we're working on a really, really interesting partnership where you're going to go into the Airglass and you're going to search for the virtual world that you want to meet in. You want to meet in the Hammerstein Ballroom. You want to meet in you know a replica of a restaurant in Italy, you'll find it in a store, it's $29.99, you'll buy it, that's what you're in. And you wanna talk about a 1967 Corvette, you'll search for that model, you'll find it, pull it into the meeting, and you'll meet exactly like I just met in that environment. We're still about six to nine months away from that, but the air glass is going from 2D to 3D. Collaboration is our first use case. Um, that one was sort of like, you know, it's it's easy to figure out that collaboration was was the one that we would start with. But education, CPG and data visualization are also areas where we're seeing lots of interest. Right. Oh, my God. The, I, I'm just thinking in my head the possibilities of, of bringing different environments, even for for personal conversations. Or, right, like you want to have a birthday party. Where do you want to have the birthday party, right? Where do you want to have the virtual birthday party? Um, you know, it's 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 not it's not a chip shot. It's hard engineering because you're going to want to personalize that room. You're going to want your brand colors inside of it. If it's a birthday party, you're going to want you know childhood photos loaded up into the wall and that type of stuff. But you know, it's it's hard engineering work. Um, we we're excited about the competitive landscape. So our competition is the hardware headset providers. So Meta, Samsung, Microsoft, um, maybe Google, Apple, 
and then the AI providers. Mostly AI providers are focused on generating content. We're focused on delivering that content. And so it's a nice open pocket for us. We're still a small company, but we think it's a big enough market where we'll be able to take substantial market share over the next decade. Right. Wow, that's that amazing. Now, what about the industry, the sectors as a whole? Obviously, you see, we've seen a lot of changes over the past few years. Um, what are you seeing that's getting you excited or of concern? Well, I think I, I, I focus on three different sectors of the market. I focus on the capital sector, right? And that one has its own dynamic right now. Um, I focus on the tech sector. And of course, I focus on culture. Right. What what's culture doing? So I think from a capital perspective, you know, I think I think it was Warren Buffett that says when the tide is out, you see who's swimming naked. Right. Um, a lot of great companies are going to evolve from this capital crunch. Right. Because this capital crunch, we too at Mobius, this forces you to go back to first principles as an entrepreneur, go back to product market fit, go back to unit economics harder than you would have when capital is easy to get created. So while it is a difficult time for an entrepreneur in the capital markets, I think this is where pressure makes diamonds. And I think great companies are going to come out uh, uh, of this. Um, broadly, from a tech perspective, I think generative is probably going to really change a lot of things. I think what's going to change here is the style of work. Peter Drucker famously said we were going to go from manual work to knowledge workers. And the motor was invented, right? And when we saw the motor the first time, we didn't realize that it was going to create all these amazing machinery and companies like Caterpillar were going to be built out of it. I was on the equator when I saw the motor for the first time in South America. All you think about is a fan because it's hot like hell, right? The thing spins, right? Make a fan, right? But the motor commoditized the, the, the knowledge, the, the manual worker. And at the same time, the PC was introduced that created this ability to share information that really opened up the knowledge worker, right? I think the same thing is about to happen. It's going to take about 10, 20 years, but Generative is going to really commoditize that information sharing, right? That information finding, that information assembly, that information gathering. And something is going to have to open up the aperture for us to share more with each other, where we're going to move from sharing information to sharing our ideas and eventually, hopefully, sharing our imagination. Obviously, I think immersive AI is what's going to open up that aperture. So I think work is going to change fundamentally because work already got hit by COVID and it already changed from in-person to remote. And now it's getting hit by generative and hopefully we're gonna enable it by immersive. These types of concurrent global, this is not US, this is not North America, this is not Asia, this is not G20, this is global, three concurrent macro things working in tech at the same time, it's gonna change work. And when work changes, it changes the family, it changes the household. I mean, think about it. Toll brothers, if they're not doing it already, they should be doing it. They need to add another house, another room to the model of the house called the home office, right? And that home office has to be instrumented completely differently, not with mahogany wood on the walls, but screens on the entire wall. So I think that's the big thing in tech. And then with culture, you know, look, I think, I think the metaverse prepped culture for this kind of deeper connection with technology, but the privacy scandals have scared culture like crazy about this relationship with digital. So culture is kind of in this bifurcated moment right now where we're really excited about the future, but man, do we hate what the future did to us the last time, <laughs> right? And so that's where I see the market dynamics are and the, the, the macro sort of structural issues that are in place. And as an entrepreneur, right, you you play those against each other and find your moment, so to speak. Right, right. And now you've just gone through two startups, right? The last one and now this one. Any sort of seminal uh, lessons uh, learned that you want to share with, with folks as far as um, those two ventures? Yeah, the number one lesson I would share with anyone going into startups is don't get attached to the outcome, get attached to the purpose. And I'll tell you, when you get attached to the outcome, it's very, very, very dangerous. Because startup by definition is a hard game to play. Very few people get to play it well. And even the ones that play it well, very few people win and get a hit out of the park. So by definition, if you attach yourself to the outcome, you're gonna be disappointed, you're gonna be burnt out, you're gonna get depressed because you got a 99% shot of failing. 
What you have to do is find a purpose because purpose is durable. Purpose is long lasting. And if your purpose is what drives you, you're going to be able to go from one startup to another, to another, to another, and get those learning cycles to win in the end. Nice. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you about, you know, the market we're in now, as far as uh, you mentioned capital, you mentioned funding. How are you seeing that? You know, what guidance can you give to other entrepreneurs who are, are raising money right now? Look, I, I think I think the thing about raising capital always used to be investor fit, right? And that is still true today. Investor fit is still very important, but you also got to think about market fit. This market changed drastically from looking at a grow, grow, grow at all cost type mentality to a cut, cut, cut to profitable mentality. And when the market shifts like that, a lot of founders find it difficult to dislocate themselves from the strategy that they had to then engage in a strategy that fits the market. So I think investor fit still matters. It matters now more than anything else, but also that strategy fit has to matter. Even we at Mobius, we were playing the bigger, broader play. And as the market changed, we needed to productize immediately to get to revenue. And I'm seeing a lot of other startup founders go through that same cycle. Now, some people struggle because you look at it and go, look at it. It's amazing. It's obviously going to work in 10 years, but that's not what the market is looking for right now. The market is looking for something that's going to work in 10 months. Got it. And for folks who want to test drive, demo, um, experience Airglass or other um, products that are coming down the road, how can they best do that? Easy. Go to Mobius.com and request a demo. Um, we have the Airglass 2D uh, that's in private beta. You can see that. You can engage with it. It does two really unique things. It allows you to work and meet at the same time because we put the video and the desktop into a perception of depth. It also allows you to be in multiple meetings at the same time. You can record yourself and send it ahead to a meeting. So Jim, if you couldn't make a meeting tomorrow, we just want to send a message to a client. You can re record yourself and just send it to your colleagues and they can play it in a meeting tomorrow. Um, so you can work and meet at the same time and you can be in multiple meetings at the same time. That is moving to 3D. Um, we're happy to show the 2D uh, one to folks and start pilots. Um, we're doing some pilots with Accenture already and a couple of other clients uh, that we'll start mentioning. And we're also happy to show you what it's going to look like in 3D. Um, what it's going to look like in 3D is going to be driven by what people want. We, we invented the technology, but we're also not experts in UX, right? And so we really want to hear, how do you want to drag something? How do you want to expand something? What does zoom in and zoom out feel like for you? Because we have to standardize these gestures, right? And part of what we're doing is we're trying to find the most natural experience for the most amount of people. And so what does it really mean to engage with the screen now with your entire body? Right. Oh, my God. This is so exciting. I can't wait. All right. So this has been a great conversation, Richie. Thank you for, for joining us uh, and sharing these uh, this great new tech and, and your insights. Uh, we usually end with a, a saying or a poem. What would you like to share with us? The thing that I would like to say to everyone is entrepreneurship is not something that you try. Entrepreneurship is a long-term lifestyle. If you're going to try entrepreneurship for a couple of years, don't, because it's so hard you won't make it. Entrepreneurship is something that's a lifetime lifestyle commitment. Got it. That's great. This has been great, Richie. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please like it, leave a review, and subscribe. See you soon.